Good morning. I would like to start by thanking Dr. Paul Brennan and the organizing committee for the opportunity of giving my perspective about the issue. I'm a clinical geneticist in southern Brazil, and I will talk about the clinician's point of view, potential of germline genetic susceptibility in diverse populations. I have no conflicts of interest to declare for this presentation. Briefly, the outline of this talk will include three topics. Number one, extensive genomic sequencing has revealed a substantial burden of germline variants in various tumors. Number two, actionability of a germline variant expands beyond its utility in defining the use of targeted treatments. And number three, population-specific genetic variants may contribute significantly to the cancer burden in a certain region. And for this topic, I will bring you one example from Brazil. So to start the discussion and talk about the substantial burden uh, of germline variants across a range of tumors, I would like to discuss very briefly two important articles that appeared recently in Nature Review's Clinical Oncology. In the first uh, article, the authors discussed the fact that uh, genomic assays that enable characterization of tumors are increasingly being used in clinical diagnostics as a means of identifying therapeutic options. In this scenario, genomic methods can reveal individual targetable alterations, mutational load, complex mutation signatures, and tumor-specific antigens which might inform the utilization of targeted therapies, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and personalized anti-cancer vaccines, which have increased survival and contributed to improved outcomes in many cancers. As a consequence, the identification of targetable alterations across diverse tumor types has prompted new paradigms in the application of genomic profiling and the design of clinical trials, as well as influence clinical care uh, of the cancer patients. In the second article, Therapeutic Implications of Germline Genetic Findings in Cancer, the authors discuss that um, a growing appreciation of the therapeutic relevance of germline variations is likely to increase the demand for germline testing and its clinical interpretation. And an added level of complexity of the clinical interpretation of these variants exists. Variants might reach a threshold of being clinically relevant for therapy, but not for risk management and vice versa. And some variants may have two applications, both in therapy of cancer patients and also in risk management for the patient and the family. A great example uh, of the recent studies that have looked into this issue is the paper that appeared in Cell by Huang and collaborators. In this study, they analyzed over 10,000 tumors, including 33 different cancer types, identified over 1.4 billion germline variant calls, and also provided uh, an assessment of these variants regarding the presence of a somatic second hit, if the first hit was in a potential tumor suppressor genes, looked at expression effect, and inferred functional consequences of these variants. In this study of over 10,000 tumors, they identified a frequency of carriers of germline variations that are actionable or potentially actionable of 8% approximately. If we look into further detail, on the left you will see that in the study about 8% of the variants were pathogenic or likely pathogenic and an additional 5.2% were variants with a possible pathogenic uh, classification. If you look at the right panel and uh, we discuss actionability of these variants in terms of determining treatment, you'll see that among the pathogenic or likely pathogenic germline variants, 
2.4% were entire one, variants for which at least one FDA approved agent is currently available, or tire two, variants with a similar evidence as entire one, but with no FDA approved agent yet. In the second graph below, you will see the breakdown of possibly pathogenic germline variants with a smaller proportion of variants in tires one and two. In addition to relevance for treatment of cancer patients, actionability expands beyond uh, this scenario of only defining targeted treatments. If you look at several guidelines, and here I show you the example of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, you will see that uh, there is already a criterion for further genetic risk evaluation in an individual at any age with a known pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in a cancer susceptibility gene found on tumor testing. So there is already a recommendation in several guidelines that these patients should be further evaluated. I'll give you an example from the clinic. In this family, you'll have a patient that was diagnosed with ovarian cancer at age 56, which was a metastatic ovarian cancer, and tumor testing was done to verify eligibility to treatment with PARP inhibitors. Identification of a BRC1 pathogenic variant prompted referral for genetic cancer risk assessment and uh, in an additional testing variant was confirmed uh, in the germline, not only in the tumor. Testing of multiple at-risk individuals resulted in identification of cancer unaffected female carriers who were referred to a high-risk clinic for follow-up and interventions. Starting with the identification of one patient, the tumor testing, we were able to reach several other family members and thus try to guarantee proper manage management in this family. Risk-producing mastectomy in this uh, kind of situation where you have a germline BRCA1 mutation is associated with significant reduction of breast cancer incidence and risk-reducing salpingophorectomy is associated with significant reduction of cancer-related and all-cause mortality. For this reason, current guidelines in cancer genetics recommend germline genetic testing in an ever-growing number of diagnoses. A few examples include genetic testing in all patients, with epithelial ovarian cancer, genetic testing in all patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma, genetic testing in all patients with medullary thyroid carcinoma, and in all cases of metastatic prostate cancer, as well as in all male breast cancer patients. In addition, female breast cancer patients, when they fulfill multiple criteria, have a recommendation of undergoing such testing, and this corresponds to at least 30% of all diagnoses. And also colorectal cancer patients diagnosed before age 50 or with someone, or, or in someone with at least one affected relative should also receive counseling and germline genetic testing. I would like to now give you an example to illustrate why population-specific genetic variants may contribute significantly to the cancer burden in a certain region. And for this, I would like to give you the example of Lee-Fromeni syndrome, which is considered a rare autosomal dominant disorder worldwide, caused by germline pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in the gene TP53. Patients that carry such variants are prone to develop early onset cancers by age 30, at least 50% of women and 30% of men will have at least one cancer diagnosis. And by age 60 years, nearly everyone who is a carrier, male or female, will have at least one diagnosis. 
The syndrome is characterized by multiple cancer types, including but not restricted to premenopausal breast cancer, soft tissue and bone sarcomas, brain cancer, and adrenocortical carcinoma, together with other different tumor types. And more than 50% of the carriers develop multiple primaries. The estimated frequency of carriers in the general population worldwide is established at about one in 3,000 individuals. Now in Brazil we have also several families with clinical phenotypes suggestive of Lee-Fromeni syndrome. But what is different in these Brazilian families, especially those from the southern region of the country, is that the majority is caused by one specific mutation, which is a founder mutation in TP53, also known as R337H. Inheritance is the same. These patients are also prone to early onset cancers in a similar spe cancer spectrum as in the classical form of the disease. However, compared to classical LFS, there seems to be reduced penetrance in males and perhaps also in females. In addition to presence of multiple cancer types in these families, uh, although the spectrum resembles LFS, there are several aspects that differ from the classic form of the disease, including a significant number of carriers with lung, renal, GI tract, thyroid uh, tumors. And the estimated frequency of carriers in the general population of southern Brazil has been established in one in 300 newborns. What is interesting about this variant is that somatic occurrence is extremely rare. This can be verified in different databases. And therefore, if you identify R337H in a solid tumor, for instance, it's almost certainly a germline variant. Of course, this has to be confirmed using another tissue, a germline tissue, where you will see that the variant is also present, for instance, peripheral blood. Recent studies in southern and southeastern Brazil that looked at the prevalence of this specific single variant in TP53 have reported that it is present in 2.5% of women diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 46 years, regardless of family history, close to 4% of children diagnosed with any cancer, regardless of histology and family history, and 1.2% of patients diagnosed with lung adenocarcinoma. In another perspective, when we just look at breast cancer, and here I cite a large study by Buys and colleagues from 2017, where they have looked at over 35,000 women with a single diagnosis of breast cancer who underwent clinical genetic testing with a 25 gene panel. The prevalence of pathogenic germline variants in TP53 was 0.2%. And this prevalence is similar in several other studies. When we look at the prevalence of germline pathogenic variants in TP53 in Brazilian patients, and here I cite two yet unpublished studies, you will see that the prevalence is much higher. And in fact, TP53 pathogenic variants are the third most common variants after mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 in Brazilian women with breast cancer. So to conclude, extensive genomic sequencing has revealed a substantial burden of German variants in several tumors. Identific identification of individuals and families with germline variants in cancer predisposition genes, at least 10% of all solid and hematologic malignancies, is an important opportunity for cancer prevention. And finally, cancer risk reducing interventions in carriers of germline variants are available and knowledge about the effectiveness of such interventions is growing at a fast pace. I hope that with this data, I have contributed to show you the importance of identifying germline variants 
in different populations. And a final message would be that identification and management of hereditary cancer caused by germline genetic variants should be regarded as a public health concern since public health plays an important role in ensuring access to interventions that can prevent disease. Thank you very much.